Good. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to our December uh, Board of Education meeting. Um, and thank you for all people attending and anybody watching us online. Um, the first thing tonight, I need approval of the minutes from our November meeting. So approved. Second. Any discussion on those minutes? All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Thank you. Um, I have not received any public comments in person. Do we have to approve the agenda first? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're right, Dave. Yep. Skipped ahead here. So, any changes? Yep, as written. So, I need approval of the agenda for the evening. So moved. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, there are no public in person. I believe we had one submitted public comment, which will be included in the minutes. So, on to our report. <coughs> Unfortunately, our students couldn't be with us, but they supplied a little update on things that I would like to read. Hello, school board members. I'm so sorry that I cannot make it tonight. I was working at a soup kitchen and now have to run back to Sub Prairie for a practice. Marissa also has a dance rehearsal. The student council has been very busy this last month. This last week, we had a penny war where we raised money to help a little girl named Alice with leukemia. We ended up raising $3,014 and are so proud of our fellow classmates for donating. We also recently participated in the Light the Night Parade and Call an Elf. This week we will be making tie blankets to donate and we'll be helping out at the Rotary Lights this coming week. Also, new to the school, the juniors had just a meeting about college to help prepare them for post high school life. PSAT scores also came out, so people are either very happy or very sad regarding that. That pretty much covers the major events at the high school this past month, and we will see you next meeting. Thanks, and have a happy holiday from Izzy. Thank you, Izzy, for being conscientious and supplying, even though you can't be here. Um, next, we have WTA reps, and we have three individuals, Amy Frank. Mel Burton and Jill Stotts. Welcome, ladies. Right, I'll start out. Um, we had the recertification vote, and that would be for um, WTA to be part of negotiations. And out of um, our voters that were participating, 99% of them said that, yes, they would like WTA to be part of that. Um, the official state record will show that 88% voted yes. And that's because any person that didn't vote, it's an automatic no. Um, so we're moving forward with that. Thank you. Next up, if you have uh, Facebook, we encourage you to like the Wanakee Teacher Association public Facebook page. And on there is a post. We had our highway cleanup this fall, and um, it went really well. And Prairie Elementary School had quite a few staff members there helping out. So. That's a positive and a plug for you to just see some posts that the WTA is putting out there in the public realm. And last, uh, some K-6 teachers are semester graders and some K-6 teachers are trimester graders. So K-6 te teachers, have, core teachers, have committed to a significant amount of time on their first trimester grades and parent communication. That's what we Thank you. Well. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much for reporting. Um, next would be any board reports on events, meetings, trainings that anybody attended that they would like to share with the rest of the board. <coughs> if not, um, the Board of Education uh, community engagement meetings, we had our second one um, November 29th on academic achievement. We didn't have the greatest attendance. Is there any way to know how many people might view it? Um, Is that something that's possible to... Yeah, we can take a look at that. It would be nice to know yeah. um, 
how many people that reaches as yeah. we prepare for that? Because I know that that's a lot I, of work. I think if you actually go to the actual video on our site, it'll say how many views there were. Yeah. I haven't looked, but we can find that out. Thank you. So we are now considering um, two more of these events, one in January, the end of January and the end of March. And we need to look at topics that as a board, we might like to bring forth during that. Time. Yeah, what, what I th these are ones that are just a carryover from our previous discussions we've had, and I think some of these could potentially link together. Um, certainly, there's things around social emotional learning that we can talk about. Um, there's things with our some of our our, our um, how we service some some of our unique populations of students, students with disabilities, 504, special education, English language learners. Um, our pathways kids, our gifted and talented kids. We also have options with around like academic and career planning, career and technical education. Um, we received some communication this week about wanting to consider would we do something on school safety. So I think there's another uh, uh, several options out there. We're also going to need to find a time where we can talk particularly around our facilities and operations as they relate to referendum. There's probably multiple options and multiple times that we need to do that. But that's a piece that's also kind of in the forefront of what we need to do. Do we want to use one of these dates for the referendum, or do we think that a referendum should stand? Um, I, I think, I guess that's a piece I would ask the, the board of kind of how you want to, how many of these meetings you'd like to do throughout the year. I mean, there is a, there's value in doing the referendum piece separate. It does kind of get into that mode of like, how many meetings are we going to ask people to attend? Which is all, which is sometimes a challenge. I mean, which ones are we going to do in person? Which which might we want to do during a Zoom meeting? The initial uh, referendum piece would definitely be kind of just laying out what are all the options. It's probably not a, a big piece with yet with kind of the big Q and A that would be coming yet. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a precursor to some of the things we want to do with before that survey would go out this spring. And I know that the EUA group would like to. And, Vo and Vogel Group would like to do what's called a community workshop and a board workshop. So that could definitely be a piece we, we tie into there. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm open either way. I mean, if you want to take something right now as the January 31st one, um, we could have at least tie that into some of the work that we're doing referendum-wise. Otherwise, there's certainly other topics we can bring forward. That was the other question. If one of those wanted to be a referendum, which Timing-wise, should um, be January or March. Or? Uh, I mean, we had the calendar written up with the yeah, we, construction team about right. when we would be doing engagement. I, we did. I mean, we had some of those pieces that were. Our first meeting with the public is really. It's, probably more presenting what are all the options and, and showing them what we're actually considering. I mean, that certainly would fit in that January 31st timeline. It'll also be after, at the January, at the, the January board meeting, you're going to get a lot of information. You're going to get information from Mark Roffers. We're going to have updates on school capacities. And we'll also have some information from PMA, our financial advisor, who will be able to articulate at least tentatively kind of what some of these costs and impacts are and how you could structure some of the financing pieces. So I mean, end of January wouldn't be a bad place where we could at least share that all very transparently with the community. Mm -hmm. so that's something you'd like to do. That would certainly fit within that realm. I think the sooner we get it out there, the better. You know, January oh. would be the better. And we already have the five or six options we had yeah. developed right. last time. Yeah, it's options. going to be something a lot more. Yeah, the big time. rocks really aren't moving. It's now just putting some of those finer details mm -hmm. that are going to start to articulate a bit of the why and some of the things that we'll be considering be kind of a precursor also to some of the of the survey pieces which have come out in the spring. Steve, yeah. you sat through a lot of the meetings I have. I mean, I think that works well. Yeah, I agree. It's good timing. Yeah, it's good. That we're, I mean, my thought is we start with that one and we can kind of envision what we want to do in March. Mm -hmm. um, you can think about what, what your other topics you might want to do at the March piece. Well, just looking at a couple of these, you know, we could 
for the March, we could put student with disabilities and English language learners maybe yeah. as one, or combine academic and career planning and career technical education in one, I mean, as one. My and thought is that two. if I was to kind of pick one of those paths, Brian, I'd probably say um, kind of the one that talks around like students with a disability and then kind of our special populations of students. What do we do to service students with disabilities, students with language needs, and then um, exceptional learners through our, like, our pathways to so kind of show the whole spectrum of, of special services. So that would be an option that we could share on the, in the March time frame. Are you, getting the, are you getting those as topics from the community at all? Or? I mean, of the ones that you see, I'd say school safety and social emotional learning are ones that yep. are definitely at more of a come to mind of people that are sure. looking for information, not saying they'd attend those, but I'm mm -hmm. just curious if we've heard anything from the other ones, was it? Yeah, I guess my thought process was more information of having families or that don't have kids in those issues with those area in those areas more of an education of okay. what we do for students that are not yeah. going in the, maybe the general population or sure. a lot of families in our district. Um, so just that knowledgeable, but I agree. I mean, school safety is a big deal as well. So. It, it's, I mean, our, these were kind of put out there to be top meetings that we could have on the pertinent topics that we were hearing from the community. I mean, yeah. and, and, and I hear from them on all of these. I mean, but it's a matter of kind of from a board perspective where you'd like to put some of your time. The referendum piece, we have to do that at some point. So I mean, I think that makes sense to fit in there. It's if there's other topics and more me different meetings you want to do, we're open to that. But the March one, I mean, I'm open to doing something around the school safety piece. I mean, so either one of those. I mean, I guess I'm looking for some feedback and what others think. Well, I think Ted brings up a good point. A lot of people came to the co-curricular one we did years ago. A lot of people came to this one on DEI. They come to what they're thinking and talking about. Yeah. And then we've all heard some of the stuff that social emotional learning is somewhat controversial now, which it wasn't two years ago, but now it yeah. is. We, and we've tried doing community engagement around topics that we think would be help in education to the community, and nobody shows up. I mean, unfortunately, you got to pick the topic they want to be there for. Mm -hmm. Social emotional learning and school safety are things at least they talk about. I'm not, the people in disabilities, if you're in it, you do find out and you do get in it. If you're not in it, you're probably not going to show up. So I, I guess it, it becomes a little bit of, what would actually attract people to engage? Yeah, I guess I was, yeah. And I agree that it, those, the school safety is what people are talking about. I was just sort of thinking, you know, people, the community sometimes has questions if they're not involved in it. And I think it's always good to have some type of knowledge out there about what we are voting on, you know, when people just, they haven't experienced it. And so. And I Maybe think that's for next a, year. Yeah, and I think that's a part for us to, as we, I mean, this list was kind of meant to be probably a bridge over not just one year, but multiple years. But I think having some of these pertinent topics out there, when you go back, and as, as Dave was saying, we've did some of these community engagement meetings a few years ago. I mean, the ones that were well attended, we did the one on AODA and student mental health. That was very well attended. And that was well timed right after the community had their thing on it. And right, there was a lot of things that we were doing, and there was a lot of concerns around that topic. So, I mean, we had engagement around it. I think that there's certainly, I mean, I, I, would, I would expand it beyond just social emotional learning and kind of the whole mental health and all of those type of pieces. But why don't you let me, we're looking at that as kind of the March time frame. Okay. March. Why don't you let me kind of work with, with my team on it where we'll kind of frame something up to bring back to show you. Yeah, another option for some of the things Brian mentioned on the um, students with disability and special education. Sometimes you've done those great little um, Randy chats online. Yeah. Maybe you could do a Randy chat because they're more uh -huh. informational and not really a discussion. Like the webinar type thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can do something like that. Yeah. Okay. Just an option. Well, yeah. Let me kind of take that back and we can kind of see what, we're, what we can put together. Okay, um, review of our COVID dashboard protocol, public health. All right, I'm going to ask Rebecca to pull up a few things. You've seen these charts before. 
Um, if you do have questions, some of the folks who work very closely with all of our COVID things, um, Annie, Chris Mann, Brian Gabarski, um, Tiffany Loken are, are all here, and they work very closely with us on a daily basis. So why don't we bring up This is the one from the last week. Yeah. So what, what you will see on our website is we post every week kind of what's happening just on a, a weekly snapshot. So this is actually um, updated this morning for the week of um, December 6th through the 13th. Um, the boxes that have asterisks either have um, zeros or an, an M number that was just too small that we didn't want to articulate because you could identify the individuals. Um, you can see through here we had um, 15 positive cases, we had 56 quarantines. Um, the one piece that we're seeing right now is, and over the last two weeks has kind of been an increase so just with, re with regards to our four case sites. Um, we've had, I think, three different sites last week that were impacted and um, those resulted in a number of kids getting quarantined. They have a little bit different rules than as being a daycare center than we have at the public school. So when there is a positive case within a classroom, it does close down that classroom for a period of time. So that's why you see a higher number of the quarantines. Um, it's also our group that is not eligible for, for vaccination right now. These are our four K students, our youngest kids. So definitely a piece that from, from our team, we've seen in, in elevation at least in and some of the cases are the impacts in those sites with regards to quarantine. Um, you can see under this piece, you had Heritage had five positive cases. The um, number of quarantines was relatively small. Um, and these are pieces that we are following the, the protocols of public health. Um, if both people are masked or if they're vaccinated, then we do not have to quarantine. We're trying to utilize that as we move forward um, continually. Um, so that's the data from just the last um, week. You can go over to the grand. Randy, yeah, just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. quarantines are because they were close contact within our school. It, it, a quarantine or? could be a close contact in school, or it could be a close contact because of okay. um, something else outside. So it's not all within the school. If you want to go to the, the grand total, then that just shows our no, the one on the far left here. Thank you. Um, this shows us from the from. Um, very beginning of the school year, kind of how many cases that we've had. Um, you can just see kind of the, the trend lines there. Middle school and high school, certainly that's a half of our population of our school district. You have um, over 600 kids at the middle school. You have 1,400 at the high school. So when you compare that to kind of the rest of the district, you definitely see that our, we've had higher numbers at our elementary areas. One of the things that we were seeing was our elementary numbers were were spiking pretty good there for a while. Um, I think that after the second dose of kids who've chosen to get the vaccine in that area, it's at least plateaued. So you can see from, the, from this week's, it's, it's much lower. But we've, we've seen kind of a, an increase in the number of kids. There's a lot of activity at the elementary level. I'm anticipating that hopefully some of that will kind of plateau out and we'll, we'll see some calming of that. Um, it's hard to know exactly how many um, students were vaccinated. That's certainly a family's choice, but from our clinics that we ran, we ran probably about half, about 50% of our kids participated. I think when we looked at the public health, gave a report on countywide, how many of the five to 11 year olds, and they felt about half of that population. So my guess is being a relatively um, highly vaccinated community. Um, ours is probably a little bit north of that, but I don't have specific numbers. When we look, are looking at quarantines, we are able to um, determine kids that are vaccinated just through the, the state network um, and then conversations with parents. But this is what's happening kind of as a whole of our district. Um, the piece that I think has probably the most meaning to us is the next sheet. This is the one that, if, if these are in your packet as well, so if you want to go to the third one. Randy, can I clarify something on sure. the quarantine? Yep. The students quarantined are in addition to the positive cases? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right, so if you can kind of scroll down here, Rebecca, to our last. 
and then increase the thank you. All right. The numbers that I think are most pertinent here. Um, so this column right here is showing new positives. Um, right now, I think what you're seeing is you have one and two for the last few days. Last week, we were 9, 6, 11, 15. Um, I think those numbers, there's also some disclaimers with regards to the DHS data and public health data that they are a little bit behind in some of their entry of information, but this is the best information that we do have. Based off of those, those new positive cases each day, our seven-day average is 8.71. Um, that's coming down a little bit. It was in the 10s, 11s, 12s there um, just a, a, few, a week or so ago. It's dropped down to about eight. We'll see where that kind of stabilizes. I believe we started the year, the school year off, we were probably around um, two. Um, so definitely we've had a rise in cases and you've seen the rise over the last um, few weeks. The other number that we take a look at is the seven day new cases per 100,000. That's way over here. Um, this is actually the number that kind of correlates with um, when, you, when you start to hear like public health or the CDC talking about there's high community spread or monitor or, or moderate community spread. That's the number they're utilizing. Any, any value over 100 is considered high spread and within the community. Um, so that number for us right now is at 303. Now that's extrapolated with our number of positive cases added up over seven days. We have about 20,000 people within our community and then that's kind of figured if we had a population of 100,000. That's how that's determined. I believe the Dane County average right now when I looked at public health this morning was somewhere in the 190s. Um, so it's definitely there's, there's, there's more community spread that's occurring. The one piece that I do find also interesting is when you look at our, our cases, particularly you looking at more middle school and high school, if you go back to our previous slides that we had, our kids are meeting in the lunchroom. They are eating in close proximity. They're eating without their masks, and we're not seeing a great deal of spread happening at, in, in those places. Now, partially of that could be because we have a very highly vaccinated area, um, number of students, but it's also kind of an indication of kind of what's occurring. What's going to happen as we, as we see other variants and such come through? I think that's yet to be determined, um, but this is the, the current data um, as we have it as of today. Um, just to kind of review for the public where we are with some of our decision points. Um, obviously, Public Health Madison Dan Dane County came out with um, a new masking order in November that goes through um, January 3rd. So that's actually the first day that we would come back from um, our winter break. <clears throat> and so we, we do have a masking order that is in place. I do not have an indication right now from Public Health whether they will extend that. I know that's certainly a piece that um, we'll be watching for in the next week. We have articulated to them that if they are going to extend it, we would prefer that that announcement come earlier than later, just so that we can all um, prepare and communicate around that. Um, the last time that this board discussed this item, I believe was in um, November-ish, and we were the decision that we had at that point was that on we were having a transition to as far as how um, we would move to mask optional. The, the mask order kind of precluded that or kind of uh, took us a little bit different direction. But the day that the order expires is also the day that we stated that we would go mask optional for families. And I think the reason we chose that date was to give families an option to get vaccinated with the two doses. Um, um, given the kind of opening up of different grade levels and age levels for that. So that's really where we are sitting right now. I believe that there's a piece that I'd like some feedback on because there's, with all of these things, there's lots of nuances and um, details around it. Our, our 4K sites, we have like seven 4K sites right now that um, service our 4K children. These are our private um, preschools that we contract with to operate our programs. Um, the question that's, that, that Amy Johnson's received from them is with regards to do they need to follow the, the direction of the school board 
um, with regards to masking, for example. And, and their reason that they've asked that question is I think that there are some that would um, certainly follow what the board has articulated, and there's others that may want to be um, keep more of their children masked, at least at this point in time, because they're seeing some increases in activity and because there's not access to a vaccine for those younger kids. And it also is impacting them from a, from a private delivery model as far as kind of trying to do everything they can to mitigate um, risk within their centers. Um, the one piece that's different with regards to quarantines at that level, and it's why you see the number of quarantines at the 4K sites that's higher than some of our other buildings, is that if they do have a positive case, regardless of, of the masking piece, um, they are um, needing to quarantine that whole class. And so there's just a few different rules between K-12 and preschools, um, and that's a piece that, um, that that's what articulates out on the, on the data pieces. And then I believe there was also a request that the board received from our music educators, um, particularly to um, extend at the, was that, at the high school and middle school, or was that was it district wide? You, I, I didn't. I think it was district. Yeah, with regards to when students are singing, because of the aerosoling with singing, to be able to um, kind of extend that out for a period of time um, to better assess kind of the impacts of the uh, of the impacts of that on on the students. And I think it was all music teachers throughout yeah. the district. Okay. So that's my report, but those are the two pieces I'm looking for a little bit of feedback on. I think we have some options with the 4K piece. Um, one option is certainly to um, stay with kind of what the board has already decided and we, and we monitor that moving forward. That's one option. Um, there's an option to um, require them to be, to be masked at some point I mean, to, for a period of time that you could assess it or you could leave it up to individual sites. The only issue I have with leaving it up to individual sites is it puts us in a position where you may have families wanting to switch sites, which really isn't a logistical option to kind of bounce between. But I think we need to have a little bit of clarity as far as how we might want to look at the, the 4K pieces and then obviously also the music piece that came to the board. So the agreement with 4K sites doesn't really address no not it, COVID specific but in terms of decisions made here not specifically it more speaks to like we we have oversight of like their curriculum but all their daily operation pieces are really on the site but we have we have a voice in how they operate with regards to curriculum we also have a hand in how we place students so we place students at the site so our placement of kids is on us, our curriculum is on us, direction of the program is on us, day-to-day -day operations is really on the site. But I think they're looking for some clarity as far as what, what they can do, what they can't do, and I think we have some, some options as far as how we would like to articulate that. Can those sites have a stricter mask policy than what we would have in the school? That's what, that's what they're asking. That's what they're asking. I think there's a couple of them that would like to just keep their kids masks. And yeah. like to be, if ours is to have mask optional, they'd like to be a little bit more stricter until they can get a sense of that. Seems like that would be within their operational. You know, yeah. They are private companies in that sense. And while me. we do place students with them, isn't there some parental choice in that placement? There's, they get an option as far as some of the, they get a say in some of that. And many of them we are able to support, not all of them. And some of them are also geographically, it's kind of where you live, depending if, on the transportation piece. So the question would become if a parent was at a site that decided to stay right. with a mask requirement, would they be able to move their student? Right, and in our perspective, we don't view that as just logistically reasonable. So be able to move kids based on kind of a procedural piece because we are trying to balance the sizes of classes and services as well so i guess from from my end it's it's either we kind of have them follow what we already have in place or we put some things more specific in place with regards to that well with what we're doing is with our buildings it's like i said it's their private place i think it's up to them then to deal with that facility then and they bring up their concerns with it one way or the other. It's really so you, you, we, your perspective is let them make that that it, choice. It is in our facility. We're not right. We don't have control of any of their other 
right. operating rules, just like you said, we, have, we can control curriculum. But they couldn't move if, if there wasn't room to move around at this time of the year anyway, no. could they? No, and I, I just, no. I also think that trying to get into that, that pattern right now, Judy, I just don't think it's a good no, idea. No, I don't think that's good either. And I'm trying not to create another issue for us no. to try to navigate here. But I know that's one that, that they do want clarity on, is if we've made a decision, can they be more strict if they choose to? So are you, so what, I mean, are you, I guess I'm sort of, we set a minimum standard, right? or do we not set any standard? Yeah, yeah so the standard we've set right now is that, stricter, is, 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 that, is that we, well, we've set a standard for our district and our buildings, right. I think that has been specific to mask optional on January 3rd. And I think their question is, it's a bit of a gray area because right. they do run their own their own operation. They, it is their own business. But I also want to be cautious that we don't get into it, put ourselves in a position where now I want to switch because of one operational decision. So I think, Ted, what you're saying is giving them options to be more strict if they choose to based on their individual operation. Correct. That's what your perspective is. Let's set a minimum. I don't know that it's still their place. Yeah. It's their place to that's the minimum. Make sure the parents are aware of what it is. They still have, you know, if they're concerned they can address it with that facility. It's just it's not our not our grounds. Yeah. But based on our uh, vote, uh, it appears that we're following the county uh, guidelines. So if the county says uh, mass adoption, or third, then I think it's going to be very difficult for us to say uh, uh, keep keep masking. Yeah. So, so I think if they're following the, uh, the county guidelines, then uh, yeah. So this would all this this issue only comes up if the order goes away. So if the order goes away, then it puts us. That, that's where I'm just looking for some guidelines as to, so that we're on the same page as, as we can walk. Are you suggesting, Jack, that you think they should not go any further than the county guidelines? No, I'm uh, suggesting that uh, it's their business. Uh, You're in the same place it, Ted is. I'm in the same place Ted is. Uh, it's their business, and if they choose, and there's parents that are driving the issue, uh, and the parents are paying for it, because it's not just the K-4, it's the whole daycare. It's the whole daycare, and, 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 yeah. and you know, so we, we pay for the 4K, or we supplement the 4K. Yeah, we, we supplement the uh, 4K, but if uh, parents are choosing because there's one or the other, um, yeah. and they're paying for it, and the daycare. What, what if, for example, this place, it's hypothetical, they had a policy that we felt was reckless? I mean, we'd probably exclude them on on the grounds that we, we're not going to allow you to do this because right. of such. So it's right. sort of the same thing. Right. Um, I don't see that this rises to that level of excluding. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with, with, with that at all. Um, but just don't want it to come back on the administration or the board for whatever decision they make on their private business. I, I think we just have to make it clear that they understand that if some parent comes in saying they want to move their student, we would not be supporting them moving right. the student. So they need to set their policy in a way that deals with the parents that use them okay. as customers. We're not going to become some sort of wedge moving kids right. or dictating their policy. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. It I think do these daycare centers have enough room where you can move from uh, one to the other. I thought that was pretty, pretty tight. Some do, some don't. I mean, it's it's not, it, there's some ability to do it. I just think it's a logistical mess for us to do it middle of the year um, over kind of one topic, which for, for some families, it's an important topic. I'm not mitigating that. But I just think from an uh, administrative piece to try to now navigate kind of a reshuffle of kids based on that issue. I just don't think that. I mean, I would lay odds there's going to be parents on both sides of masking who want to move their kids. If, right. if the place goes optional, they're going to want to go to a mandatory. If it goes mandatory, they're going to want to go optional. They're private businesses. Yeah. They can figure out a way to swap kids, let them. But that's not our problem, is it? 
or is there a funding? The 4K piece is our, is our placement. So we, we place the kids on the 4K. Once they some of them have wraparound care and other things, that's kind of on them. But the 4K placements we do geographically if they need some of the busing, and then there's some choice with regards to some. Oh, yeah, we have to deal with the busing bill. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it becomes a bit of a, a little bit of a gray area because they do have a lot of operational authority on how they run their business. And they have, they have kids in that space that are not just 4K. So there's some protective measures that some of them are just concerned of. And, and, and I think we're just looking to make sure we're on the same. If somebody wanted to be more restrictive, um, that they would have the ability to do that for their site. We need to make a motion on this? Or? But uh, just sure. to be clear, but then if, let's say there's two sites, one goes mandatory, one says optional, and you got 10 parents at each site who say they want to switch to the other one, would we say no? And the two sites say, oh, yeah, we can swap students. <clears throat> so they're fine with it, and now the parents are blaming us for not Well, there's, there's the, the thing with regards to the um, kind of getting into the finance of 4K. Sites are funded through 4K by their students. So there's a student, I mean, there's not a lot of swapping between them right now based, I mean, I, it's hard to answer your question, Dave, because it, it, I don't think it would ever come out where you're going to have five leaving one and five coming to the other, and it's just a, an equal split. Well, no, you're going to have yeah. seven, and you're going to have but 12. The piece we don't want to get into is trying to now navigate reorganization of, of classes and class sizes and who's going where and transport. It, it's... So we, do we straight up say they can't move? Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I, if... From my perspective, I would say we can give them the sites the option if they want to be um, set up additional rules or be more restrictive in this area, but the school district's not going to change placements based on that. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know how many, I mean, you, you're projecting how many folks this might impact. Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. Just want to be clear. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to vote on that? Yeah, or? I think that'd be great just for clarity. So we would need a motion to allow the 4K to be more restrictive. If they choose. If they choose. Allow them to set their own policy. To set Correct. their own policy. I think that's a good word. Make that motion. I'll second that. You can include the piece about moving students, or do you want to leave that out? No moving. Yeah, we get it. I, I, they're going to ask for that clarity at some point. You can either say it now or say it later. Just say it now. Yeah. Say it now. Okay, let's vote on this and then we'll bring back another motion on the moving. So we have a motion on the table to allow the sites to set their own policy. Um, all in, any other discussion on that? Regarding? In, regarding face mask. Okay. Yeah. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. And then we would also like a motion on the movement of kids if they don't like what their site is doing. Make a motion that we don't move any children from the K 4K sites in the mid, mid year. Based on this, based on based the prior on motion. Masking, based on the right. masking policy. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Uh, I, I'm going to vote no because I think there are some parents who are going to have strong opinions one way or the other on this. And this is a chance where they really have an option. But I'm voting no, understanding I'm putting Randy in an awful position. That I'm not sure operationally it can be done. But I'm not sure operationally it can't be done either. So. Isn't going to be our. We're not involved with it. They can work it out with. Or is that not even a possibility? Probably something because it's our program and because of the way the students are placed. And I would state okay. that because of kind of how we fund the 4K and help to fund it, that it travels with the kid. I think it involves us. So. And I get that. And I know the virtual option was a tough option to do too. Yeah, 4Ks, that's not, not a great one. 
No, but, but I'm saying this is similar in a way of, right. yeah, we, we have to bend over backwards. Is it possible? Maybe not. I just don't think we know yet. Yeah. And I. So there is a motion on the table to not move sites, not allow students to move sites over masking. And there is a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Thank you. Thank you. And then we would also like to talk about, or is there anybody who wants to make a motion on the choral programs oh. in our district? Yeah, I want to make a motion that we um, that we keep masks in our vocal music classes, um, and that we reevaluate that month to month. So should we reevaluate it in January? Beginning, beginning in February. February. Beginning I, in February. I, I would submit that uh, we keep it for a quarter, you know, as opposed to talking about it every month. If we're going to make the uh, decision to do it, keep it in for uh, two or three months and then come back and look at what the numbers are. Uh, and if the numbers are, are dropping, you know, uh, you know, and that way you can truly evaluate it. You know, in a month to month, you know, you see that uh, the bar's not moving that much. So I think what you do is you, you know, uh, it, do it through March. Is it so that type of a, is it that type of a looking at it, or is it the feeling of the choral teachers that they're being exposed? No, it's. The end is it's sort of all vocal, like they're doing it in Madison, professionals, and so it's not just our teachers. It's what's happening in schools in, in or organizations that are teaching music. So then I don't know that we have to look at our numbers here every month. I think, but do you? They're requesting it. Do you allow them to make the judgment? even that too much judgment because we're going to have our policy if you want to go beyond that you're requesting that you have you can control your classroom to that no uh, i think we should control the classroom or we will have it's this many. specific one and that's we, this can't go to other ones like if we open it up to this one um such and such because they feel that class well it really just doesn't fit for sitting around and you know so it's really specific to this well, and that's why I, I said February, just so, because it may be in February for you. It's a different story. To me, it makes sense, Brian, to look at, for this specific topic with their own, give it till February, and then, let, then let's evaluate where we are. And maybe then we want to do right. a longer time. Because when I look at the, the, the quarter, that takes us really all, all the way to spring break. And to me, that just seems like a long time to project that out. So that'd be two months from now, at, within the February time frame. To me, at least, gives us an idea where we're at. Well, let's come to uh, the March board meeting and evaluate it at the March board meeting. Because that takes you to your end of the month uh, when you come back. So, if I had the motion to February, aren't we supposed to get a second or a non second before we just continue to discuss? Or can we discuss after second. the motion is set? Okay. You have a second for February? <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's why just so we can right. he's just right. so we can keep going. We have to have a motion on the floor in order to discuss it. All right. So we do have a motion and a second for February. Do you want to amend that? Amended uh, address it at the end of March board meeting. And we need a second to that. No second makes that fail. We're back to the original motion to address it in February. Any other discussion? So help, help me understand, when are we going to address it in February? Is that February board meeting? Yeah. February board meeting. February board meeting. Through the end of February? No. February board meeting, and then we will discuss it and make a recommendation at that point. And it doesn't have to take this long? No. No. It might only take a minute or two. Right. Yeah, you'll get a pretty good sense of where it is. You'll, it'll, uh, my intention is just to kind of give an update every month. This is so everybody knows transparently where we're at. And then that can fit into that. Yeah. Okay. So, any other discussion? All in favor of revisiting the coral in February board meeting, 
say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the committee reports. Um, we're just going to kind of run through these. If there are no action items, I will just ask you to refer to the minutes. HR has no action items. They do have minutes submitted. Same with the DEI subcommittee. But um, curriculum, Judy, I don't know if you want to report, or Tim, we have a new course proposal as well as a... You did it. Judy always does that, not you, though. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you said Tim. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 he answers to anything. <laughs> so, Tim, you're going to report on new course proposal and the reporting tool. Or yes. whatever else you want to report on. So we... Um, just a few things to touch on. Uh, we did have one additional course proposal. It's the uh, additional section of Bill Harmonic Orchestra. There'd be some renaming associated with this. This is an evolution we've already done at the high school with band and vocal music. Uh, as with the music proposals you saw last month, uh, we do anticipate this would add some fractional FDE. As you know, our, our budget outlook for the coming year uh, looks to be uh, very challenging. So our recommendation is, and this is the recommendation all the way through, including the committee's recommendation, is we approve it for the purpose of putting it on the books. We defer the implementation until next year when we think the budget outlook may be more favorable. And so that was... Um, where the committee went, uh, that would be something that we would be looking for a motion uh, from this school board. So, looking for a motion to approve the um, new course of the orchestra. So moved. Second. Second. Any other discussion on that or questions for Tim? All in favor of approval of that new course, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Thank you. Uh, the next item uh, is uh, the student reporting tool that you've been hearing about really for uh, some months now. Uh, and this has uh, been through uh, different cycles of feedback from the advisory committee, the curriculum committee saw it at the last meeting. It's been to both of our level admin teams, so principals have made some suggestions on the wordsmithing of this. And again, the purpose of this is really not to create any new processes downstream from when we gain information. This is really designed really to open up another avenue for information uh, to come into our pre-existing processes. We don't know uh, really until we implement this uh, how commonly it's going to be used um, I know that there were some uh, questions in the feedback process. Could this be open uh, for abuse? Potentially, that's true of some of our existing processes as well. And if we do find that to be the case, then we would have to monitor and make some adjustments. But uh, again, the purpose of this is to make it easier for individuals to uh, report things that happen. Uh, and although a lot of our lens around this so far this year has really focused on its, its role in uh, providing a reporting mechanism for bias speech and other problematic incidents like that, I think it's also worth noting that this is also another avenue for individuals to report instances of bullying. And I think, you know, with all of the uh, really tragic conversations we've had to kind of revisit recently around school safety, we know that having effective anti-bullying strategies is very important in our overall school safety approach. So, you know, again, this is uh, an addition uh, to the processes we have in place, and uh, it was something that the committee recommended uh, to come to the full board. Uh, if you do approve it tonight, uh, then we will circle back with our principals and look to roll it out sometime very early in 2022. And this is electronic? This link. would be electronic. You could get to it off the website. Uh, we also envision, and probably in all of our schools, putting up in some locations a QR code so you could scan the QR code 
and uh, start the report. So, um, I think we'd be looking for a motion to approve this reporting tool. I'll motion to approve it. Second. Any other discussion or questions for Tim? I want to thank you, Tim, for taking the lead on this. I think it's something that we need, and I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, Just Tim, the the DEI ad hoc committee, Joe Lewis, everyone who's had their hand in this, is, yeah. we appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So the, the reviewing of it in three to six months or through whatever that, I, I think that should be specified, like, right, and I mean, definitely follow up and make sure that we um, are potentially getting any abuse, given the anonymous, anonymous ability to report that that's the thing that's concerning, I think. But. Yeah, we, we, can, we will definitely want to get a sense of what information we're we getting, how much of these reports are anonymous, because that is an option. Uh, again, we would always say, and can I, I want to reiterate this, it helps us from an administrative perspective to address things the best when we have the most information, and that includes knowing who's submitting the report. But indeed, this does have an anonymous feature, and we will, if we implement it in January, as we expect, I would anticipate somewhere between the end of spring break and when we conclude the school year in June, we would bring in a status report uh, to the board. Perfect. Any other questions or concerns? If not, all in favor of the reporting tool say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Thank you. And I think one more item for you, Tim, the uh, report card. The report cards, and there's a lot in there, and uh, that's all in there, not because we're going to go through it tonight, but that's really for your information. And although we do have it linked to off the district website, uh, if you go to quick links on the start of our district webpage, it'll take you to our district and school report cards. You know, the public can also see what's in board book, and there's a lot of information in here. But Rebecca, if you could just bring up the uh, it would be the fifth link, uh, the detail for the school, that one right there. And this will just provide, we'll walk through this, this is the district. Uh, this will provide you and the public with an introduction to how all of the report cards are laid out. Uh, and then I'll just open it up if you have any questions. So what you see here, uh, it's important to kind of set the stage. We did not have report cards last year because an important um, source of information for the report cards are state tests. Uh, almost all of our state tests did not occur in the spring of 2020. And so with a lack of much new information, really a report card in 2020 in some respects would have been the same as the previous year. So we skipped a year. During that time, there was already uh, a revision program underway. Um, DPI was looking at best practices from other states and feedback from school districts and the general public, so there were some revisions. But for us, uh, when you look at this, uh, you see what your demographics are as a school district or a school right at the top. Then you see a score summary. This is on a 100-point scale. The way you get to your score depends on what data is available for the calculation. It also depends to a degree on your percent of students who are taking free and reduced lunch. So even though there are four priority areas, achievement, growth, target group, and on track, and they each have their own score, you will notice if your eyes track to the right from the overall score circle on the priority area weights, you will see that the pieces of the distribution are not equally sized. And so in our case, uh, growth uh, contributes a small percentage, overall achievement contributes a large percentage. That is because we have very few economically disadvantaged students in the district. And the model our state follows is districts that serve higher poverty populations have greater weight put on their growth performance uh, because the thinking is 
that there's a lot of research that shows that student achievement does correlate some with economic factors. And the thinking is, well, let's hold those schools and districts more responsible for the growth they achieve rather than the achievement. So that's why we have the weights. If you look at our numbers, our two highest areas are on track to graduation um, and student achievement. Uh, all of these areas, and in particular, um, the achievement and the on track and the overall score uh, are very high within Dane County. We had the uh, highest district score in Dane County. And within our benchmark group of 22 districts, that we use for comparative purposes in the state, we were in the upper half uh, for the overall score. If you could uh, go on a little bit, Rebecca, I just want to highlight a few things here. Uh, this shows our breakdown of schools. All of our schools were exceeds or significantly exceeding expectations. And this would have been true, there was a, an adjustment to the cut scores, uh, contrary to some popular speculation that had nothing really to do with the pandemic. It had everything, actually, if you go back up, I apologize, Rebecca. That target group outcome uh, is new. Uh, it replaces a previous priority area called closing gaps. And because the closing gaps score performs statistically different from the target group score, DPI goes through a process that tries to provide a certain kind of distribution of scores. And when they change out the closing gaps calculation as a component for the target group and the overall calculation behave differently, they needed to make some adjustments to their cut scores. So you can continue on, Rebecca. So these are very good results. We have no schools and alternate accountability. Uh, if you keep scrolling, Rebecca, um, you know, we go down, we see our summary for what our high, low, and average scores are for the overall and these priority areas. For the district, uh, when you get to any of these four priority areas, you will see the score for that priority area, and then you will see a histogram that shows the distribution of scores throughout the state and a descriptor telling you where your school or district stands compared to uh, the other districts or schools in the state. And so districts compared to districts, uh, schools below high school are compared to other schools, schools that graduate students like high schools are compared to each other. So you can see our overall achievement score is at the right hand of the distribution, which is very high. Then it will break our uh, overall performance down by our different demographic groups. It will also show, uh, if you scroll down just a little more, it'll show the last three years there's testing data for, and you'll notice there's a gap uh, in there. There's no 1920. So it's the last three years that they have. And then a little later on, you'll see the test participation rates. As you know, that was soft for us last year. If you continue on to the growth section, Rebecca, you will again see our score and you can see where we stand in the state. Again, we're on the right hand side of the curve, but not as far as we were for achievement. So that's something we look at. The statistical model uh, that generates the score uh, also gives us the same information for a demographic group. So if you go down, yes, this. So what this does is this shows us all of our different demographic groups that we have enough data in the district uh, to calculate a score and the count of students you see in the parentheses. The center line of a three is the average for the state. And when you go uh, better than the state average, you will have a score of 3.5, 3.8, and you'll go to the right. Where you perform below the state average, you go to the left. And when you go below average, you have an open box. And you can see we have one area with an open box. When you're on the state average or above the state average, you have a closed box, which you see here. <coughs> this is designed to represent standard deviation. So if you think way back to your basic statistics, 67% um, of everything is within one standard deviation of the middle. So 
when you see, which you will see for some of our schools, uh, growth numbers that are four or better, those are really good numbers. Uh, the district, we do have some high areas, um, and for some of our schools, these areas get, get very high. Keep going, if you could, Rebecca, to the target group. So this is the new area this year, and what the state's doing here is, if, if you remember back to the old closing gaps area, it was very noisy, it was very hard to explain what was going on, and it was very difficult to predict how your school improvement efforts would affect the score. What the state is doing here is they are looking at your lowest quarter of students. So they look at your lowest quarter of students in uh, English language arts from the last time there was a test, and then how did they grow since then? They will look at your lowest 25% of students from the last time there was a state test on mathematics. How did they grow since then? And they will also look at, from an attendance and graduation rate perspective, your lowest 25% and how is that moving over time? So the whole purpose of the target group is to really, on the report card, provide the public information uh, and to really help us track our process in a way that complements what we already do in terms of meeting our students who need the most support. Our lowest 25% of students when we look at absenteeism, uh, achievement in mathematics, achievement in language arts. And if you go on to the last section, Rebecca, we have the on track to graduation. Uh, and this really looks at uh, four things, chronic absenteeism, graduation rate, which is an average of four-year and seven-year cohort rates. You may wonder why a seven-year, doesn't almost everybody graduate at four years? And of course, the answer is yes. However, uh, you will remember that we do have students who, due to their individualized education plans, are allowed to continue the programming beyond four years. The purpose of a seven-year rate is to capture uh, what happens when that portion of students uh, completes their transition plan. It also looks at third grade language arts and eighth grade mathematics. The last thing I, uh, I'd ask you to scroll down to, Rebecca, is as part of the report card redesign, we'll keep going a little bit more. Um, this doesn't calculate towards the score, but the, the section beyond this, if we go down just a little more, is just some information on post-secondary preparation. So this is for information. It doesn't go into the calculation, but it will show student participation in advanced courses, and in our case, that's advanced placement. Uh, dual enrollment, those are courses where we have uh, a parallel enrollment situation with either Madison College or uh, UW Oshkosh. Uh, Industry-recognized credentials. Uh, so there is a program in the state where students, uh, whether it's uh, CNA, Microsoft credentials, what have you, they can pass examinations and get affordable credential uh, in a field. And then work-based learning, uh, this could be things like co-ops or youth apprenticeships. So this shows you our percentage of students uh, at the high school in this type of program compared to the state. And you can see that in all of these areas, we have higher participation and post-secondary preparation of the state overall. And then if you look below, it breaks it down by our demographic groups. And when we talk about um, trying to create more opportunities for all our kids, one thing you'll notice here is that uh, some groups have higher participation rates than others. Uh, you'll also notice, with very, very few exceptions, that even when you break it down demographically, uh, our students are much more likely to participate in the state as a whole. So, for example, in Iwana Key, a little over 20% of our economically disadvantaged students at the high school take AP courses, compared to uh, the state as a whole at 11%. However, uh, again, our overall number was 37%. So, you know, you can see there's a gap, uh, but then our gap is less uh, than the state as a whole. 
the last section on here, and, and then I'll just uh, take any questions you might have, also provides information on our arts courses. And so again, this doesn't calculate, this is just for informational purposes. We can see what our student participation in art courses, dance, music, and theater is compared to the state. And you can see for art, and then how it breaks down demographically. And you can see for art and music, we have a higher rate. Uh, now you may be wondering, where's our theater course? And the answer is for us, that earns an English credit. And that's the way we're set up. And so this is pulling from the state's data collection. If we counted our theater course as a non-English language arts course, uh, it would show up here. But since we counted towards English, which we can do, it doesn't count towards the theater calculation. But we do have uh, drama courses at the high school. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. And again, if you have questions after the fact, uh, you know I always like to talk with you. So <laughs> reach out to me. We'll have uh, a little deeper dive into this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tim. Thank you. Um, next is co-curricular, and I think we have a number of items here that yeah. we, we need to vote on. So our co-curricular uh, committee met on November 30th, and then here in May presented uh, several items for us to uh, discuss. Um, everything was passed um, uh, by our committee to bring to the full board. So. Uh, number one, uh, we want to talk about the drama reorganization and propo proposal that has been set forth. Uh, there hasn't been much change since 1975 um, regarding the drama, or, uh, dra drama program. Uh, what uh, they're looking for is to the addition of a winter play um, along with the, the fall one act and the spring musical. So there'll be three um, uh, events uh, every single year and along with that um, Rick is, is, is asking for um, some additional positions uh, to be able to manage and run these uh, these events uh, effectively um, and you'll see in the notes that uh, in the little chart they've got uh, fall one act winter play and spring musical uh, the positions in bold are the new positions that uh, rick is asking us to um, approve to move forward with uh, there is a budget impact of between 25 and 37 thousand dollars and this money would have to be um, uh, found <laughs> to be able to move move this forward uh, next year so if I can add one thing, Brian, I yeah. think some of these positions that you see highlighted as new positions, some of those have been standing positions by volunteers, and some of them have been stipend then out of like gate receipts. So this kind of formalizes some of those pieces to make sure that we probably do them in a, in a, in a more formalized manner from an HR perspective. Mm -hmm. so, but I think this is a, a good proposal in respect to I guess I correlate it to like sports. We have three seasons, kind of the fall, winter, and spring. And in, in my mind, kind of on an annual basis, being able to offer that to our music and drama students, I think would be positive as well. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Um, any other discussion? And this would be for 22-23. Correct. So um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Okay, thank you. All right, our second uh, proposal is from Mountain Biking Club. Um, they've been highly successful um, in their uh, short stint as a, as a club, and we're looking to uh, move them from Category C to Category A. Um, this would be for the high school only, not at the middle school. Um, along with that, um, they were, were, let's see, it'd be, uh, We've got some um, issues to, to discuss in terms of making sure, because competitions happen on Sundays. Um, and then also, um, um, it, again, like I said, it, it would be basically consistent for the high school 
middle school would still participate, but they wouldn't be recognized as the, the, the category A. Yeah, so this is just a, a shift very similar to like what where we have categorized for like our equestrian club. Um, we initially approved the mountain biking club as just a, a category C to start with. Um, I think as we started to look at kind of how it how it competes and and, and how those students are, are interacting within the club, it fits very well within a category A. Just to give you an idea, I think category A is everything that competes from the sports to um, forensics, one act play. Category B are those things that perform, and category C are more of those social type um, service kind of uh, programs. So I think this this makes sense. Um, later on in the agenda, you will see a, a policy change to move so that we compensate any program that's a category A, um, given that there's more competition, more responsibility, as opposed to, um, and we would only bring forth a category A program that had sustainability for the future. So, so. so we're looking for a motion to change this, um, and then consequently would have paid coaches. Bringing up the whole sun Sunday thing, is there any other ones? Any other sports or activities that we have on Sunday? The only thing that we would have is we have um, ski and snowboard have Wednesdays. So we've made an exception for, um, so right now we have to have our activities done on Wednesdays by like 6.15, 6.30. Um, the piece that we have, so with snowboard, that's the only night that they do it at, I think at Tyrol, is that right? Yeah. So in order for us to compete, we have to participate in that. And the mountain bike club, the only time that they, the mountain bike organization, the only time that they compete is on Sundays. So in order for us to support that activity, we have to kind of go along with that because there's not another option with, regard, with regards to that organization, availability of their um, track, I guess, or their, their the, the venue. Yeah, it has to do with uh, park availability spaces. Typically what happens is Saturday they come in and they set up the course, they put up all the gates, and then Sundays are the race, just the race day. Yeah. Yeah. So we're kind of locked in to when that league has those dates set up. Many, not all, but many of their competitions are prior to the school year, so I don't know if that has any impact or uh, sway in the decision making, but yeah, most of their season is done prior to the school year too. To right now, our policy allows for um, me to make the exception, but I think, it, and, and we, we do that usually when we get into the spring of the year, mm -hmm. mainly it impacts like Wednesday nights. But I think just from a clarity standpoint, that as we approve this piece, continuing to move forward, just realizing that this activity does take place on Sundays um, as a competition. So Dave did make a motion to approve this, but we need a second. I'll second it. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. One no. No. One no. Okay. Um, I think the middle school cheer and dance. So we have middle school cheer and dance. Was um, we're looking for paid coaching positions, approval for um, paid coaching positions. It has existed for the last three years and now eligible for a paid position. Uh, they are requesting uh, two paid positions, middle school cheer and middle school dance team. Is there a reason why they put in that it's less than cross country? So the reason that it's in the notes that way is that's how we determined this number is we took what was in the high school handbook and <clears throat> in the high school handbook, the cheer team is paid 1% one point less than the, cheer, the cross country team. So just as an equivalence, that's how we did it with the middle school. That's how we assigned these percentages for the middle school cheer and middle school dance positions. But so that the cross country in the high school is paid less than the dance or the dance in the middle high school cross country is paid 1% 1, one point more than the high school dance coach. And then this would keep that same sort of relationship. And we're not open to asking why about why there's a differentiation? Well, uh, or you, yeah, you can, um, the seasons are longer. Um, there's more students involved in cross country. Um, but we will see later on here. I think we have a 60 student athletes. So out that's there. how you get your pay scales. Good. Yeah. How, how many people and how long the season? Right. Okay. Yeah, we'll, 
Yeah, Brian and, and Aaron sit down, they take a look at equivalencies, they look at the seasons, responsibilities, number of athletes, and then that's how we evaluate kind of what our what our scale is. Good, thank you. Okay, so we'd be looking for a motion to approve the chair and dance team positions as paid positions. So moved. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Thank you. Okay, the next one is winter cheer. Um, it used to be uh, offered years ago, um, but it uh, ended um, looking to uh, bring it back, and winter cheer would um, support or be a part of um, cheering on boys and girls basketball, and then also adding cheer competitions. So and that would be beginning in 2022 and 23. So we'd be looking for a motion for this. Do we know what all these positions are, uh, what the uh, budget implications? You know, we just added, uh, yeah. you know, uh, theater, 25 mm -hmm. grand, we added fees. You know, obviously it's probably minimal. Yeah, I mean, most of these are relatively small. I mean, the uh, drama one's a little bit larger, but these will be pieces we'll articulate as we go through the budget process to show kind of what those are. Uh, but yeah, there's, I mean, when you're looking at these middle, these, uh, the middle school ones are, help me out, Brian, I'm blanking out, or? Two to four thousand dollars approximately. Right. Mm -hmm. Those would be paid out of, the middle school ones would be paid out of Fund 80. Yeah, middle school ones would be paid out of Fund 80 because those are, Kind of how we're funding those pieces, but these are. What did you say, Brian, for like the winter cheer? Two to four thousand dollars, depending on depending on the years of experience, right? Yeah. Little background on cheer. I think when we kind of go back, as Brian said, we used to have both. Um, we used to have cheer at, in different events. Certainly, over the last um, probably twenty years, it's kind of gone down to just being for the fall and primarily just for football. Um, I think when I go back just in my memory, I mean, first year I was here, there I think our, our cheer squad had like two or three kids on it. And it was, and I think from there they built it up to the point where they had a lot of kids involved at the, at the high school in a football program. That's what precipitated really the wanting to expand it to the middle school. And then from that, the program has built up to where there's interest from the students to want to do this and bring back the winter season. So I think from that respect of keeping some of the kids involved, I think the other piece you shared, Aaron, was that there were some kids that were not, that were involved, for example, like if you were in cross country in the fall, you couldn't be in cheer. But if they're not in a winter sport, it would give them an opportunity to do um, another activity. So. Um, did we get a motion? No. no. So we're still looking for a motion for the winter cheer. Put a motion in for winter cheer to start 22 and 23. I'll second that. Any other concerns, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. And lastly, I think no. is the. We got two more. Two more. Two more. So, the live stream coordinator. Um, you know, give credit to uh, Mr. McConnell and his students for really coming up with um, what has been an excellent um, opportunity for everyone to look in on, on who we are as a Lonnie School and School District and, and some of our students' achievements. So, um, however, it has become so big that um, it is a little bit overwhelming. And so uh, they are requesting a live stream coordinator position to assist. Um, with coordinating our co-curriculars and our activities around uh, the school district as well. Right. Yeah, so just a little bit of background additionally. Um, previously we approved at the board um, a position that was to coordinate really the, the scoreboard at, at Warrior Stadium. This is different. Um, this is really, even though it involves right now Mr. McConnell who is really kind of leading this, this is, is really working with the students and looking at all of our different activities to be able to coordinate that work um, that we do all of our live streaming with. So that was things like graduation last year, many of our sports that we have moving forward, 
Um, there's opportunities here that I think we can generate funds as well as you start looking at advertising options, etc. But as we take a look at this service that we provide for a lot of our activities, we, we can fund this through Fund 80, um, which would be a community service piece. We're getting a great number of views of our, of our, of our events, and I think it brings great exposure. So fr from that respect, I think this is a, a, a great move and something that's really kind of pushed us in the forefront as far as the quality of productions that our students are doing. So we're looking for a motion to approve this position. Motion to approve the stream coordinator. Second. Any other questions, discussion? I, I would hope that as this develops, based on how many we have, that the live stream be added to things like drama, not just sporting events. Mm -hmm. Because like this year, you couldn't go see the one act play, right. which is too bad. I really wanted to see it. Sure. But, um, I think we should seriously consider not just doing it for sports. Yeah, sure. good idea. Look at some that's, of those options. That's part of the discussion. One of the things is when you purchase the rights to those one acts musicals, that's part of the the rights package that you have to purchase uh, the live stream rights or the right. or the digital production rights. So you run into those copyright issues issue. with some of those productions. Mm -hmm. I just want to add too, I mean, this is um, a great opportunity for our students around the district to be seen by recruiters and, and, and college admissions and stuff like that and some of the things they're doing. So uh, this is one of the best things I've seen that we have coming for us uh, to give our kids exposure. But plus the skill these kids are learning. Yep. Yeah, it's great. Um, so there is a motion and a second. All in favor of paying this position, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Thank you. All right, and we'll get back to the GPA and stuff. But uh, the last action item um, is the recommended change of policy 370.2. Uh, um, it's basically right now what we have if you participate in a middle school sports that you are um, that if you participate in club you can't participate in middle school sports at the same time um, we're looking at uh, changing that and allowing students who participate in both club uh, sports and school sports to be able to do that simultaneously but also putting the school uh, sport as the priority um, in that process. So we'll be we'd be looking to uh, change the policy to allow middle school students to participate in both school activities and club in the same sport. This is just middle school, right? Yeah. A little bit of the history here. We we used to belong to WIAA as part of the middle school. We don't any longer, and many of our most middle schools don't. And as a result of belonging to that organization, this was the rule that was in place. Once we left WIAA at the middle school, we kept it in place from a policy perspective. Um, now that's been probably 10 years since we've implemented that from my memory. Um, but I think what Aaron has brought up to the committee was that we're, we're, we do have to commit for middle school sports to kind of a conference schedule for all of our programs. And as we have this rule in place, it's limiting some of our programs from some of our kids participating because they are involved in, in some of the club activities. Um, so this would allow us, hopefully, to get bring some additional students into these programs, also allow us to make sure that we can sustain these programs with our conference um, schedules that we need to. Anything to add to that, Aaron? No, I think you summarized that pretty well. Uh, Part of our middle school affiliation, conference affiliation, is that we're able to support uh, volleyball, cross country, boys and girls basketball, wrestling, and track and field at the middle school level. Um, so I don't know that this is going to hear all the some participation woes that we're seeing in some sports, but I think this is a step to, to help relieve some of that pressure. Uh, talking with middle school athletic directors in Sun Prairie. This is the route they've got, and they've had a nice symbiotic relationship them with their clubs and their middle school programs. Yeah. So, so this is a policy. This one actually just came right from the committee to the board. It did not go through policy committee. 
Um, but you do have the option per our policy for our policy and policy adoption that we can approve them in with one reading if we choose to. If you want to kind of use this as an informational item and bring it back next month, you have that option as well. So from a policy perspective and approval, you can make that motion here tonight and that is totally acceptable. Would this be immediate change then for this winter? Uh, That's a good point. I think it, I would look to have it go in fact for the girls season, which is next year. January, if, if so for the girls basketball, Girl basketball season. season. So you'd like it. So it, if if it was approved, you'd like it to go into place for the for the January seasons yep. coming up. So so what are the what is the challenge we're trying to solve with this policy change? You know, because if you're on a, a school team, you know you should be on the school team. You you, you know you're on the club team. How do you make that choice that I'm going to go to play the club sport or the team sport if those competitions uh, so the, conflict? Yeah, right now it's trying to open up the gates to have more participation on our teams. Um, many of our club teams, they'll have their tryouts or their team assignments done in September and October long before we've set up anything for boys or girls middle school basketball seasons. So that takes out those kids from being able to participate on, on those teams. Now that's not to say that those kids will still will come out, but by making that decision in September and October, they've taken, we've, they've now, they now can't come out under our current policies and rules. Um, so we just want to be able to have that option because we know middle school kids change their mind, aren't, aren't sure about things. Uh, you know, so it's just having that option there. Hopefully, it'll help our participation numbers um, at the middle school level for some of our different sports. So which, uh, sports. Which, which sports are we having problems with? I, I don't think it's cross country or track. No, it, was, it would be the basketball, wrestling, it's mostly our winter sports that are seeing the issues. Okay. So now they're out for club, and if I'm not out for club, I'm probably not going to make the uh, middle school team. So you're really cutting me out if I'm not out for you club. Just, you just add more teams. Yeah, we would add extra teams. Like we do with volleyball, we have volleyball. We have eight volleyball teams. We don't cut anybody on those teams. We just add teams to them. Right? Uh, you know, in the past we've had to have situations where. Uh, for middle school girls basketball, we've only had 18. Um, where in our conference, you're supposed to have two per grade, 18 and 18, to be able to match up with them. So I don't want to be in that situation again where I'm now telling our conference partners we don't have the teams for them to play. Because at some point, they're just going to say, why, why, what's the benefit of us having you in this conference? The other piece I think we run into is there's not possible. many there's not many districts that there's many districts that allow this already. So when we send our our students into a game, to speak from a basketball standpoint, some of our teams are getting defeated pretty handily because they're up against these kids that have um, not only the the club and the non club kids. So I think it's to, when, when we made this policy and agreed on it a number of years ago. I think that was the right decision. But kind of listening to where Aaron is and just kind of watching this over time, I think it's it's time to reevaluate it and, and consider allowing kids to do both. They've got to be able to manage that. Um, certainly work that with the coaches, but I think it's I think at this point it, it's time to at least consider that as a change for this policy. So uh is there any discussion on this on the uh, high school level at the uh, WIA subcommittees and so forth? Not that I'm aware of. No. But that's the next step, though, right? Well, I, I don't know. I'm not going to try and predict that future. We'd be looking for a motion to make this change in the policy if you're ready tonight. Otherwise, we can do it as a first reading and bring it back in January. But it sounds like Aaron would like it to implement in January. So if you're comfortable, if anybody can make a motion. 
When does the girls? They would start, start in January. January. Well, their first practice is January fourth. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it would be the so all these other things we've approved, my understanding is they start next school year. This yeah. one you want to make effective immediately. I think Aaron's asking for it to okay. be there. If the board's more comfortable Clear. with it being in the future, we can do that as well. Yeah. It's, it, it, it directly impacts some things he's working on right now. I'm not sure, as Aaron said, I'm not sure how, how many kids that impacts um, who are going to make a different choice, but it at least gives them the option. Yes, it is my fault for not asking you to do this, but probably should have a second reading with the actual policy change spelled out. Sorry, I think we do. That one's up there. It's just what it does, it takes out that last section. Because all, all the policy stated was that you couldn't, eligibility for middle school was you couldn't concurrently. So the change is you just remove that. So we just removed it and then. Right. Put in there that the school takes priority. Right. Pre previously, this language wasn't even in the policy until you scroll down a bit. I guess it was 2015, 13 or 15, um, where we made that change. Um, actually, I think it might have been. And WIAA then ruled what you could or couldn't do. So we added this language just to articulate eligibility for middle school. What we've done is just eliminated it here. That was the modification policy. But so, you, you need that new language in there also about the priority of the school activity. And we can add that piece in here. I guess I didn't add that in the end of my notes here. So if that's part of what the motion would be, we can make sure that that's articulated. How would that actually be? I could see that being conflict for sure, right? Yeah. You're going to. Who wins out that battle? It's like, well, I, fine, I don't want to play then, and then, right. and that's the way it goes. You know, you have some background, Aaron, and how that works in other places that kind of have this in place already. Well, yes, yeah, they same thing. They ask that during that six-week season, that it's the priority that you're not, you don't miss practice, you don't miss games for your club practice or games. And you know, with the setup here in Wanakee, the way the way the the BDL is currently uh, constituted. Well, they don't start practices till after our middle school practices are over. Their competitions are all on weekends. We don't have any middle school competitions on weekends. So the only potential conflicts are are really away games or game nights when they might have a BDL practice over in the you know, at the Prairie Gym, but they've got to play in that game that night. So it will be up for the coach to decide how they want to handle. They decide to go to BDL instead of playing the game, next game, no. then you sit. <laughs> uh, so that will be coach's decision, basically, if that happened. Yeah, that would okay. you know, be a, basically a, a rule we would spell out in that parents meeting on uh, January 18th or whatever day it is that, that the start of the season. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this was supported 2 4 and then one abstained, but um, yeah, this, we used to do this in high school 30 years ago and stuff like that. It ran just like that, you know, between it did, there wasn't conflicts. Uh, it was more like who, if you pitched for your high school team, you couldn't pitch on the weekend for your Legion team. Right. So, but that's just between coaches. So I, I see this as, um, helping our athletes. Um, we're not cutting. You know, we're adding and having a son who came through middle school basketball. I know that there were plenty of schools we played that had three or four teams, and we only had two. So we really couldn't. And uh, and I understand the whole trying to be fair to the rest of our athletic conference um, to be able to provide games and provide competition like everyone else. So. I support this rule change. So, do we have a motion to I'll approve make a it motion tonight? To approve it. Do we have a second? I'll second. Go ahead. Ted, second. Any other discussion? All in favor of making this change, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. Thank you.
And lastly is the um, proposal to realign the WIAA. Yeah, I'll take this to start with and let Aaron kind of fill in. And what you see in front of you tonight is really a, a, a response that Aaron put together with regards to um, kind of a unique piece that comes out of WIAA, which is conference realignment. They allow any of the member districts to put forth a conference realignment request. So in this case, it's being forwarded by Monroe, who would like to move out of the Badger Conference. And hence, there's a domino effect of that. So as you can see in the, um, if, you can, if, you go to the other if you can go back to the other, the, the document from Aaron, Rebecca, thank you. And just go down to the part, you can see kind of, keep going, keep going, right, there. right up a little, sorry, I'm sorry, that one right there you can see kind of what they're looking to do proposal one is Monroe going to the Rock Valley and you can see the domino effect uh, what Monroe's proposal is is then for Wanakee to move to the big eight and then the, the next piece that Rebecca had up was really the formal response that we would have from from our school district with regards to that issue following our co-curricular committee meeting WIAA did ask us what our position was on it, and Aaron articulated that. Um, what I wanted to do is just make sure we bring that forward, because there will be subsequent uh, meetings from WIAA on this issue, and I would like to kind of put forth what our official position is from the district. Um, our, our position is that we do oppose this because we just don't feel that one key right now is a good fit for the Big Eight um, for a number of the reasons that Aaron articulated in the memo that's attached. So. If there's any questions, I'd let Aaron kind of be able to want to answer that, but that's why that's in front of you here. Um, I thought I saw a news article this weekend that the WIAA had considered the proposals. Ours wasn't even on the list anymore. So yes, they did. They did hold a, a what they call a working group meeting, uh, and where they take the different proposals. Monroe's, um, and Belvedereian had one. A few other schools. Um, and they modified Monroe's proposal at this time. And that would leave Wanakee, no, Wanakee would remain in the Badger, Sun Prairie would remain in the Big Eight, um, but Monroe would get their move over to the Rock Valley and uh, McFarland would then come into the Badger Conference full time. McFarland is already a member for a handful of sports, hockey, swim, um, they would become a full time member pick um, in Rose Place. So at this time, it's not part of the proposal, but in their next, you know, they do have subsequent meetings and things can still change between that now and then. Um, there is, you know, at this time, I would say school enrollment, the amount of teams that we offer with, is why we're not a, a fit. Given yeah, where that sits right grow, now, with the, yeah. Change yeah, thanks for sharing that, Aaron. But with the given proposal right now that they would keep Wanakee in the Badger, I mean, obviously somebody else could petition to say that that's not the right. Yeah. Does it still make sense for us to put and, and kind of have a, a unanimous kind of a view around this this piece for, from, from your perspective so we can send that forward? Yeah, they've, they've still talked to Stephanie Hauser, the executive director of the WIA, she still says we should put our position forward. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So administratively, our position is, as Aaron articulated, is, is for us to stay in the Badger. I mean, I guess from my perspective, I'd ask the board just to endorse that so that we can put that forward as our official stance. Do you want a motion? I would, yeah. So, um, anybody willing to make a motion to endorse this? So moved. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the last thing I just want to say, and we've had a very successful fall season in all of the co-curriculars from sports to one act plays. Um, our sports participate, participation numbers are, are high, um, and our GPA summary is also in the notes as well. Um, our all sports average is a 3.5, which is, is outstanding, and it just shows that uh, of our student leaders that are in co-curriculars and uh, um, our outstanding students as well. So, 
Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Um, moving to the policy committee. We have a couple policies in front of us tonight. Yeah, the first we already kind of touched on with regards, it came up with regards to the mountain bike club, but really the policy in question is, if I remember correctly, it's just a category A um, activity would require a paid Correct. a paid um, coach yeah the only change we made to that policy was we um, in the application process it talks about the three-year kind of waiting period or to be asking for compensation for an advisor's position and the discussion we had at co-curriculars and then at policy was that if we are approving a, a category a program otherwise a competing program that we felt that that should qualify for pay. So that's really the, what we've articulated within that policy change. So are these first readings or are we gonna vote on these? The, per our policy, you have a choice. You can either ask these to come back for a second reading or you can vote on them in the spot. Um, the, the mountain bike club change that we were articulating was for next school year. So if you wanted this to be a second reading, you're not holding anything up by doing so. I would make a motion to approve. Mm -hmm. yep. Second that. Um, any other discussion? All in favor of this change in policy 370 rule number four, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one. Yeah. Next one we discussed um, what was the recommendation from the last meeting to talk about. Um, the public comments portion of our meetings. Um, and there were a few different topics that we had regarding them. Um, it was a pretty decent discussion. Maybe we can bring yeah. anything and highlight yeah. them. Generally, what we talked about here was this was, we at a previous board meeting, we kind of modified our, our COVID practices to go from an hour listening session to 30 minutes, which aligns up generally with what our policy stated. There was also a question from some board members with wanting us to review this policy with respect to, do we want public comments to be able to be held on any topic, um, whether it's on the agenda or not? So our current policy allows for that flexibility that we can, um, um, to allow public to come in and make a comment about things on the agenda or that are just germane to the business of the school district. Um, the committee, after quite a bit of discussion, decided that they wanted to just keep the policy as it is in, in an effort to not preclude public from being able to comment on germane issues to the district. But one of the things that was requested was for us to clarify, I think it's on second page, Rebecca, um, with regards to public comments that came in electronically and then just being able to articulate that people could put forth comments um, electronically for a specific meeting, but also making sure that it was clear that those public comments would then be reflected um, in the official minutes for the meeting. So this is just really a modification of some of the language we've been using for the last number of months. Um, I kind of tweaked it just to fit this policy. Um, certainly if there's any wordsmithing that you'd like to consider, we can do that. Um, but this was kind of a first. This language was requested from the committee and I brought it here for, for review. I have a question on, on that one. The, the idea that you need to have your public comments in an hour before when we've got yes. them. And I don't think anything that comes in after an hour should be included in that meeting because we haven't had a chance to read it. And so it's not really part of the meeting. So um, I question that. I mean, do you have a suggestion, Judy, as far as what you might want to see? Do you, do you that, care when it comes through? I mean, I think anything that is going to be in the public, the minutes of the public comment should have been by an hour before the meeting should started. Have been submitted prior to an hour before the meeting. Yeah. So then we can we can look at them and because if it's come while we're talking, it's not really part of the meeting. It's coming afterwards and we've attached it to the meeting. And actually, it would just show up in the public comments of the following. And, 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 and that's okay. And that's okay. Yeah. So we can make that it's already. like any other. It's like any other email that we get. I mean, that's all public record. But I think to attach it to the minutes of the meeting, 
when it wasn't part of the meeting, I, I guess I object to that. So, so you just want to make sure that the public comments that are reflected in the minutes for the meeting would be ones that you've had an opportunity to at least review prior to the meeting and limit that to the ones that were an hour before. Yeah, and I mean, because they could come in and speak at the meeting. Right. But yeah, to the last and minute. But anything that comes in after that would be then reflected in a subsequent meeting. Yeah. That would be your suggestion. And would you suggest that be an hour? I'm sorry to speak here, but I, I'm the one who deals with this a lot of times. Would you say an hour before the closed session? Close. Because you will not see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it has to be it before, before we start, before, before before we meet as a board. Because so be, we can't review them during closed session. It would be an session. hour before the closed session. But doesn't the, the meeting actually start as an open meeting at 6 anyway? So our publication is actually, right. our meeting start at 6. Right. So it would still be an hour before right. the... That we convene. Right, yeah. hour before convening of the meeting. That's fair. Thanks, that's fair. Mm -hmm. So are we saying that uh, in this policy we're just going to let anybody talk on any comment uh, anytime they want to? Well, I think I, I am not in favor of that because when they come, you know, basically one of the things that we talked about uh, and the way the policy was, we gave people uh, on the quarter, they could come and talk about any issue that they wanted to talk about. Uh, when you sit down and take a look, they can come and talk about any issue that they want, but the board can't do anything about it if it's not on the agenda. Right? Well, we don't do anything about the comments anyway, necessarily. Well, what, what you're looking for are comments on of topics on the agenda. You know, you want that public input because this is our board agenda. This is what we want input from and all of these people you know we're not we're not silencing anybody because we've got email addresses and as we've seen over the last year year and a half people will reach out to the board you know if they're up, upset with uh, a specific topic you know this is a business meeting and this I mean, this did, we had a pretty good discussion yeah. about this, and I am in agreement with that. I, from the standpoint of, I I feel that they come in and they have an agenda to speak something, and it has nothing to do with the meeting, and we can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like there's a better method of getting your point across. I don't know what it is, but um, I wouldn't want to see it limited, I guess. I agree from that standpoint, but I don't see its effectiveness to to allow that if it isn't part of the meeting. I don't. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I see that too when you think we're here to do something. This is a business meeting. This is a, like, yeah, we're, we're sort of to do something. If you're talking about a topic we, we're not even going to discuss or have any agenda, I kind of agree. You know, we're okay. looking for uh, information. I would, we had a discussion about this pretty heavy. The concept was we do have a time limit that's now coming back. And part of that is, as the president, when they hand you a, a paper saying they want to make a comment, they're supposed to write what it's about. And the idea then is for the president, as running the meeting, to pick the ones that are specific to the agenda and have those comments first to make sure those get in. And then based on time, if someone has something in it, it's not any subject, it's something germane to the school district, to then use the remaining of that time to let those people speak in order to get that in. Because just like anything, you know, some people use email, some people don't, some people understand every little policy rule. Some people come in here wanting to talk about something about the school district and didn't read through our policy manual to decide how they could talk to us. Personally, I think if they spent the time to come here, we can spend a few minutes to listen to them. And three minutes is not an overly burdensome amount of time for someone who spent the time to come here and talk to us. We should listen to them. If it's germane to the school district and the people who are speaking specifically to the agenda would be given priority. I have a question. Oh, 
question uh, to the president, do you feel like you can do that? Can you weigh that, make the decision, the topics? They almost always identify what they're going to speak on. And now that we have it limited to 30 minutes or 10 speakers, whichever is greater, if we have more than 10 speakers, we have to agree to allow more than 10. It is, you know, it's, it, it can be changed. But yeah, I think we, we can definitely monitor Prioritize. that. Or reduce. Or reduce, or reduce the time period from three minutes to two minutes. Well, you know, as long as we have that 30 minute safeguard, then I don't think we're overwhelmed. Because I think we were getting overwhelmed. And it was. There were times, I mean, when we were in the midst of COVID, we wouldn't start our meeting until close to 9 o'clock. I know. I mean, we would just go on and on. And I agree with you, Jack. We have a business and we have stuff that we need to do, and we don't want to be here till 1 o'clock. But I agree with David. People don't know how to approach us, and it's intimidating, and it's unknown, and... If they take the time to come here, I think we should listen to them. And it's only two to three minutes. If somebody comes here, makes the effort to uh, speak, I don't think they're intimidated uh, to speak in this board. You know, they may be nervous, but, you know, I, I don't think they're intimidated. They're motivated because they've got, you know, a topic. But again, this is a business meeting, you know, and the uh, topics that are addressed should be based on, you know, the topics on the agenda. All right. Uh, and we've got four times a year where anybody can come and talk. But that policy was actually changed two years ago. We haven't had that four time a year for, I believe, two years. Yeah, I mean right. that since uh, this, the previous. Yeah. Right. So you know, it and, it and, has been. I don't agree with that. I get you don't agree with it, Jack. There's a, a difference of opinion. We can make a decision based around that. I just think they are the taxpayers. They voted us into office. We are serving at their discretion. We can listen to them for three minutes. I, I don't get the burden on us of that. Yeah, I, I guess I haven't seen anything that's really come across that can't be tied to something that's not on the agenda. If you have a DEI report, it's, you know, or if you have the mass COVID, COVID update, COVID yeah. update it's on the agenda. So I guess we've seen plenty of meetings though where we spent that 30 minutes to an hour talking about something and that was it. And then we went on to the meeting and that was, then we'll bring it up the next month. So kind of that point, yeah. like I said, there has to be a vehicle for them to get those comments here. It just doesn't feel like the most effective way an email of getting it to the president so that it can be distributed. There just seems to be a better way. I don't know. Well, I think we definitely have been generating more um, conversation from the public in the last year and a half, two years. I mean, we used to never get an email. Yeah, nobody was in those chairs. <laughs> for, you know. Nobody would come here and nobody would email us. I mean, I was president for years and maybe got one email over three years. I mean, it has definitely changed and heightened, and I think people are more willing to share their concerns and their perspective. But, you know, I guess at this point we have a couple options. Um, we can do this as a second reading, think about it, or if somebody do wants to do it as a second reading. Okay. I think you're going to need a second reading because we have to make a modification to the yellow. The question is, is there anything else that you want as far as any other language? Because what, what you talked about, Jack, was what we talked about at the committee level was the previous policy which did our practice, which did allow for quarterly pieces. So if that's something that you'd like kind of articulated out here and it can be kind of a choice option at least you can see it in front of you and then you can make a decision i would like that choice okay so you'd like to be able to see kind of the current language and then also language that would show the alternative piece kind of like what we did at the policy committee so that you can see that in front of you 
The only other thing that I brought up at the policy meeting was it seemed strange when we had, in some cases, people outside of the district come in, not invited to talk, but they were able to come and talk. And I guess we're in open enrollment. People could do that, but it seemed a little bit odd that they were giving their opinion to us. But any comments on that? I don't know. Yeah, and that is actually articulated in here. I believe it's on the front page, the first page, um, towards the bottom, I believe. It's right here. Each speaker, upon being recognized by the presiding officer, will state his or her name and identify his or her connection to the district, if any. So, so. Don't need any. Can the policy committee look at the actual request form for public speaking? Because do they always complete the required information? Because if not, then they shouldn't pretty be speaking. Much. Pretty, pretty much. much. Pretty much. Pretty much. Actually, we're trying to tweak it a little bit because it, people have been very confused. They don't know if they're opposed to something or not yeah. opposed to something or if they should just be inf informational. Well, what, what, what I'm concerned about is that opposed or not opposed and having that. Because one side, one group can come in and say, well, let's just take up 30 minutes. <laughs> right. And we want to make sure that we we have a better idea of what they're speaking at what side they're speaking on so we can have a mix and not one side dominate half an hour so yeah, they but, have to articulate that now i think we're, we're, we're probably going to look at maybe this clarifying a few of those pieces i have a question ted i i don't know that i've ever had anybody okay. i can't think of anybody who's come that wasn't part of the district yeah. We have a lot of those? We, yeah, I can specifically think of one woman who came about the uh, Native American issue yeah. who was not part of our district. Okay. But she did represent an organization that is the largest Native American group in our district. Now, you can say she specifically isn't part of our district, though. Um, but that might fall more under the representing a group at that point. Right. I think the uh, challenge today is we're, to your point there, but I don't think we're, we're, representing, we're, we're representing the people in our district. And quite frankly, she's not in our district. For that specific person who's not in our district. We allowed her to speak. You know, we had public comments, closed them, and we allowed her to speak halfway through the meeting. You know, again, this is a business meeting. Uh, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but you know, well, keep were there other examples of people speaking? That's the only one I can think. Is there anything the board would like to see modified on this part of the policy? It's really just that last sentence on this paragraph. Really are, are you trying to get to the point, Jack, that you want to bar anyone who doesn't have a connection or live within the district from speaking? I mean, is that what you're asking about? Or? I'm the one who brought it up. I just pointed out that that seems strange to me. If no one has an issue, I can leave it the way it is. They'd probably fall in the criteria if you had a whole bunch of speakers. Well, you're at the bottom of the list, you know, you know and maybe you won't get to speak. So. Sure. Yeah, if you have the discretion to shuffle, then you do. They're going to have to articulate their connection to the yep. district as part of our process. Okay. Yeah, I can that. Okay, so right. we're going to bring this back. So we'll bring it back just to clarify. We'll, we'll clarify the language on the electronic submissions per the conversation we had with Judy, and also we'll put in the option that Jack asked for, just so that the board can see kind of the two different approaches. Is there any other ideas other than those two approaches that you'd like me to kind of vet out? I mean, right now it's you kind of let people speak on whatever topic whether it's on the agenda or not, but it's germane to the district. The second one is quarterly they can speak on any topic and on all the other months it's with, within the agenda. And that was our previous part. So I'll break those both out. Is there any other options that the board would like considered or are those two sufficient for now? We'll bring Rebecca and you and I can bring that back. <laughs> Okay, moving on to the facility committee. I think I skipped over one, didn't I? Um, Actually, the reviewing oh. the rule three thirty rule. Did I not? Those were the only two I saw. Those are the only. 
that I just wanted yeah. to put on. We voted on. We voted on the the yeah, it's just we discussed. Never mind. Four. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So facility, there is one item there that we are voting on. Um, basically, we approved the capital project list for the year earlier at a previous meeting, and all we're doing is coming back and changing one item out to add one item in for roughly the same dollar value. So the Prairie Playground project would be replaced with funding the electrical um, emergency power for the high school. It was decided that that was a higher priority. So we're just shifting nine thousand dollars from one to the other. Motion approved the change. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You did well. Um, the budget committee had nothing to vote on, mostly information and planning. So administrative reports, recommendations. Um, so now we have the um, memorandum between the village and the office. Yes. Um, thanks, Joan. Um, this next item in, in your packet, you will find a memorandum of understanding that we worked on with the uh, village of Wanakee. It also has um, some additional correction instrument language with regards to the deed. Um, to the library site, the old library site. Um, a little bit of background for the public on this issue. Um, adjacent to the high school's uh, parking lot is the parking to the old library. Um, in the deed for the library building, there's actually a, a reference that um, should the library no longer be used for municipal purposes, that the parking area that's just adjacent to our parking lot and adjacent to the upper parking uh, or upper area of that um, previous library building used to be owned by the district. If the facility is no longer being used for municipal purposes, it would then revert back to the district. Um, the district and the village have been in conversation about this for um, a significant amount of time just to kind of understand exactly kind of what this language means to both of us and also looking at kind of the utilization of the, of the library site. Um, with the village looking at options to move their village hall to the library, we also felt it was important for us to then articulate and clarify really what the language within the deed uh, means. Um, so the memorandum of understanding simply states that um, the village has really two years to kind of utilize that space at the, at, the, at the old library site for municipal purposes and in this case looking at that as a, a movement for the village hall we have some ability to check in on that um, progress of that work and if after a two-year time period from the signatures on this agreement um, the village failed to kind of meet the provisions of the MOU then that those parking areas would revert back to the district. We would put forth a corrective um, instrument to um, and, and a quick claim deed to bring those parking areas back into the district with then the option to also rent them back for a nominal fee to the village for future use. So the memorandum of understanding board that you have in front of you is one that's been collectively worked on between the village and the district along with the corrective instrument which just articulates really what this what the language within the deed actually means because there was some ambiguity with regards to an, uh, an attachment that, that no longer existed within the reference. So I believe the village has already um, accepted this agreement um, and I'd be asking the board for, for your support of it as well. Um, and then with the ability for us administratively to then articulate and say, sign off on this agreement. Is the utilization of the facility for daily operations or they could they use it for storage and call it that they're using it. Uh -huh. I, I sort of popped in my head. Uh, I mean I think might not what, what, what are they telling you? Yeah, they're serious about yeah, they're, what, I, what I'm understanding and talking to Todd, they're, they're very serious about moving here. You've obviously seen when they came and presented here that they've done a significant amount of work um, in talking to, to Todd over the, just over this past week. Um, there are going to be continued conversations that are going to be moving in front of the 
the village board with regards to this issue and, and with, with regards to their move. They're still trying to articulate out exactly what that plan will look like. Um, but I think from, from our perspective, I think this gives them a time frame to, to make that move. It puts it within that two year time frame that we stated. We have the ability to um, call together for a, an, an update on it. And if they don't meet that standard, then there is a reversionary piece to it. Um, which I think is really what we were interested in was was making sure that that whatever was put forth in that deed and then within that language was cleaned up, was articulated, and if, if certain parameters weren't met, that it reverted back to us. And then we can, I mean, from our perspective, being able to then work with them um, to for the best of our part of our community, I think it just clears it up. Right now, it's just ambiguous. So no, it does well. say the, the execution of this MOU complete the re relocation of the village hall right. at this point. Correct. So Correct. Anything else would be would not satisfy. Yeah. Make the motion to approve. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Thank you all. Thank you. So we have a result of a parent-teacher conference survey done. Yeah, this is just, a, again, that. just for, for information to the board, there's no action on this needed. I mean, this past fall, we just a few weeks ago, we had parent-teacher conferences. Really what our approach to that was, was to conduct them via Zoom. And then if there were parents who wanted to have an in-person meeting um, to have that option available to them, and which, which some parents did take advantage of. Um, just included in, in your packet is the, is the full results of that survey. I think it shows that there's a significant amount of support for continuing with that format to be able to provide parents an option of, of the Zoom piece, I think, which is um, extremely convenient for, for families that um, either have little kids or when particularly, from my experience, at the high school where you're able to schedule it in and actually not have to wait in lines outside of classrooms but also for the families that would prefer to um, come forward and come in and be in person. Um, it worked well for us to be able to offer that as well. And this was just the survey that came back. I think it supports generally what we were doing. It gave us some suggestions of how we could improve, particularly as we look at Zoom links and some of these other sign-up pieces. But um, overall, I felt it was um, good information and things that we are looking at administratively to see how we can improve it. But it definitely gave us some good feedback on how conferences have gone and things that people would like to see in the future. Yeah, good information. Thanks yeah. for doing that. Um, I think one of our last items is to approve a girls hockey co-op for yeah. this year. Yeah. yeah, this came in after the co-curricular committee met and this is something that we have to do periodically is, is, is reaffirm our co-ops. Um, our we are part of the Capital City Cougars and Girls Hockey Co-op, and this is just affirming our continued participation in that. So we would need approval for that co-op to Motion exist. Motion to approve the Girls Hockey uh, Co-op. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Thank you. Uh, announcements or correspondence, Sandy? Uh, I don't think I have any in there this evening. No. So we are down to consent agendas. Um, we could take them all or pull anything out. While you're thinking about that, I would like to acknowledge some of the wonderful donations this month. Uh, Peter Fish giving $5,000 for the <coughs> Innovation Center. David, in your um, efforts to um, organize the Ho Chunk flags um, that are flying in our school. A number of people who contributed to our Student Financial Assistance Fund, the Engie family, the town planner calendar, the Heinemann family, um, one community bank we mentioned last month, but their donation has come through. And lastly, Lone Girl, who uh, contributed $1,200 to our food service and um, all of those donations are greatly appreciated. Thank you. So, um, anybody want to pull anything out? Otherwise, I take a motion for the whole consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. It's a breeze. <laughs> um, Rebecca, did you get a second? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any questions or discussion on any items in there? 
So all in favor of approval say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Thank you. And the board business is to confirm our participation in the state convention. Who's um, our delegate this year? What? Mark was supposed to be, and I submitted my name not knowing if he could. He can't. I know Jack is going. If you'd like to be the delegate, no, that's okay. and then I will. Um, <laughs> I've actually gotten out of it every year, so I've gotten there 10 times without going, so I'll do it. It's actually a good experience. So, Rebecca, you want to submit the early, for the early bird registrations, is that tomorrow or this week? I would like to submit tomorrow. I need to submit by Wednesday, so if any of you are thinking about it and want me to just hold, let me know that too. Um, but I would need to know by Wednesday if you want to go for early bird. You can still submit up till like I think a week before or something right. like that, but we just would be paying extra. Right. Okay. All right. So we don't need any more no. meetings scheduled? Yeah, I think we we covered all of our meetings within the committee structure, so I don't think we have anything extra that we need to submit right. tonight. So motion to adjourn at 9.10. I, I don't know if that's allowed. <laughs> but I'll make the motion. And I'll second it. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. All right. You too. Remember what your jobs are this, this week.